Hi everybody, my name is Chef Gerard Viverito and welcome to my COVID kitchen. Here I am in upstate New York due to this pandemic and it may look a lot different than many of our professional kitchens that you're used to seeing us in, but I'm here to show you that Malaysian palm oil is equally at home as it is in a commercial kitchen or food service operation. I am going to bring you today one of my favorite comfort foods from when I lived in Southeast Asia and it's a crispy spicy chicken sandwich which is normally popular in a very famous let's say chain restaurant and I adhere to a keto diet which is very high in fat and low in carbohydrates so I remade this sandwich in a clean keto version where I will substitute almond flour for wheat flour and I'm going to use palm oil for frying. I am also going to use it to make it an Asian inspired aioli, which is a French style mayonnaise, but I'm going to make it a little bit more aromatic and flavorful. And many chefs like me enjoy using palm oil because it has a neutral taste. It won't overwhelm the flavor and it's got a pleasant buttery texture. Knowing that it comes from Malaysia also guarantees to me that it's sustainable and that is a huge, huge part of my life. So what we have here is all our ingredients and this is what we would say in chef world is mised out or mise en place which is French for everything in place. Here I have my almond flour breading station, my chicken already pre-cut, we're going to make an aioli and then with that aioli we're going to use a little bit for the bun and we're also going to use a little bit for the slaw. So I'm going to show you how this oil works in all applications. Behind me I have my fry kettle set up. I have a candy thermometer in there and it's set to 325 degrees Fahrenheit or for those of you on the metric system that would be 165 degrees Celsius. To me it's the perfect frying temperature and I like to go a little bit lower than I would with um, certain things like potatoes or or uh, wheat flour because almond flour is based off of nuts and nuts are fat and they tend to um, burn a little bit quicker. The beauty of using the palm oil though is it's got a lower or a higher smoke point rather and it doesn't get that acridness, it doesn't turn trans fat, it really does make an excellent excellent finished product. I think we should start with the aioli and then make the slaw out of it and then we can keep that reserved or chilled. So here aioli is a like I mentioned a mayonnaise. This little gem comes originally from Provence and I can honestly say there was no way that um, I was going to put mayonnaise on anything except your standard American tuna salad sandwich until I was in living in Europe when I was in my late 20s as a chef and that's when I discovered the silky emulsion sauce. This recipe will make a pint you can make more or less, but the beauty of having extra is you can use it as a base to add more flavors to. You can use it as a sauce. You can add extra ingredients to it. So I'm going to make a semi-standard basic aioli, but I'm going to use the palm oil in place of olive oil. So the first thing I need is a couple of egg yolks. Here I'm using free range eggs because they're higher in omega-3 fatty acids, but if you don't have free-range eggs at your disposal, feel free to use conventional. I don't want you to feel like you can't make this dish if you don't have the exact same ingredients I do. I just happen to live up in farm country and know a bunch of farmers with a lot of birds. And right now, in these times, they're looking for people to use them. And lucky us. All right, so what I do with my eggs, the yolks, I'm just going to whisk them in, make sure they're homogenous, and then I'm going to add a little Dijon mustard, after all, it's traditionally French. I'm going to add a little bit of garlic, and I'm going to add a little bit of vinegar, and then I'm going to whisk. See all the ingredients are in a bowl. And I want to whisk this till it's a smooth, even, distributed mixture. 
once I can't see any different colors or streaks, it's time to start streaming in my oil. When you make an emulsion, you have to be careful about how fast you add your oil. The rule of thumb is generally you can add a little bit and then you can add twice as much and then twice as much as that, so it's exponential. So as you can see, this palm oil is bright orange, red in color, and that's because it contains vitamins and tocotrienols. And all of these are really great for your heart, your liver, your brain. So I'm gonna slowly whisk this in. And I like to add it until I see it's completely incorporated. I don't like to see any chains or streaks of oil. You can see that just beautiful deep color. That just instant sign to my brain that it's about to get fed as well as my gut. Once all the oil is blended in here, I'm going to season this up a little bit more. So right now this is our basic standard style aioli. If I was in France, it would probably be olive oil, lemon juice, garlic. But in this case, I use the egg yolks, I use white wine vinegar, I use Dijon. And the beauty of using the mustard is it acts as an emulsifier, so it helps hold our dressing together. We don't want a broken vinaigrette. For those of you watching in other parts of the world, aioli is a French word, remember, for something like a mayonnaise, and a mayonnaise is a cold emulsion sauce. This is such an excellent base for so many dishes. All right, now that it's starting to hold, I'm gonna speed up my incorporation. If you find that your mayo is getting too thick, you can always thin it down with a little touch of acid, such as lemon juice, or maybe a little bit more vinegar. And if you find then that it becomes too acidic, if you added too much lemon juice or vinegar, it's a good tip to always remember that salt will help balance out acid and bring it back to base so it doesn't taste too sharp on the palate. Once my oil is all streamed in, put my bowl off to the side. mayo. To our aioli, this is a basic aioli now with the exception of using Malaysian palm oil. Now I'm going to give it a little bit of Southeast Asian inspiration. I have here a little sriracha sauce. Put in, I've got a little bit of tamari, which is a gluten-free soy. A couple of drops of that. One of my favorite ingredients ginger. It's got some great healing properties as well as flavor. And a fun fact, when you peel ginger, the best tool to use is a spoon. Just pull the spoon up and around the ginger versus a vegetable peeler, in which case your yield or your loss may be too great. So I'm just microplaning this into a nice fine paste. Alternately, if you have a ginger grater made out of shark skin or a vegetable grater, use whatever you may. But I prefer a microplane, I think it has many uses. I can just scoop out exactly how much I want. Here we have our ginger, I'm gonna add that. Put our tools over here. Incorporate that all in so it's nice and silky. The beauty of aioli is you can actually make it and store it in the refrigerator in advance. So many people always ask me, how do I get all my food up at one time so that when I have a dinner party or friends over or loved ones, everything comes out at once. Learn the tricks, learn how long certain things take and work to your strengths. Now, I talked about adding some acid to this just to give it a little bit of extra burst of flavor. I'm going to take a fresh lime and I'm going to juice it, stir it. Also, chef tip, if you refrigerate your aioli, the fat is going to solidify and congeal, so do not be afraid. It will get thicker when it's cold. 
And so we take out this line, and then I'm going to make a coleslaw. So I'm going to put the other line in my shredded cabbage. So now we can get rid of this. We have our beautiful aioli. Here you'll see we have our shredded cabbage. And to this, I'm going to add some sliced red onions. I'm going to add some sliced jalapenos. I would always recommend taking out the seeds and the ribs of a jalapeno. I like to cut straight down the side and do that repeat four times and take out this rib and the seeds because that will add bitterness. We have some bread and butter pickles, which will add a hint of sweetness. We have a little bit of garlic. And then we're going to add in our aioli. So we're going to just start with a little bit. And then blend this all together. You can see that beautiful color. So here I'm mixing this all together. Make sure it's nice and even. I don't want any clumps of mayonnaise. I also don't want it drowning in mayonnaise. I like the aioli to provide that little bit of flavor and just a touch of binding, but I don't want to overwhelm the sandwich. We already have so much going on inside this dish. So here you see we have beautiful golden. By just lightly dressing it, we can still maintain the transparency so we can see our internal garnish, such as our red onion, our jalapeno. And since I really appreciate functional cooking, I'm going to add one more ingredient to this, which is going to give us a little bit of boost, and that's some fresh cilantro. Now, cilantro is an amazing ingredient because it's one of the few that you can not only use the leaves, you can also use the stems and the seeds. So feel free to use as much of it as you want. I'm just going to this has already been washed. I have it sitting in a little cup of water to stay fresh. I'm just going to take these leaves with my fingers curled under. Remember, you want to start with this you want to finish with the same amount of fingers that you started with. So I'm just going to run my knife through here and I like to do kind of a rough chop because when I eat herbs, I like to be able to bite down on them, express their essential oils, actually taste the flavor. Some people work at such fine knife skills that they mince them up to the point that you can't even really notice them in the dish. So then we're going to add our cilantro leaves to our dish, making sure we have full utilization. As I said, sustainability is very important to me. Whether I pick a product, catch a product, or buy a product, I want to use as much of it as humanly possible, or as much as the product dictates. This way there's no waste. Let's aim for a waste-free world. Okay. So now I've got this beautiful, beautiful slaw. And we're just going to put this off to the side and reserve it. Should I take these out of here, make a little bit more room. It's always important to work and clean as you go. Not only will it make the end result easier to plate up, but it'll also make sure that you utilized all your ingredients and you did not leave anything behind. So, our next step, we have to take our chicken and we're going to bread it. And by breading, I absolutely mean that we're going to use an almond meal breading. Here, I've got some black pepper, some salt, some cayenne, and I've got this wonderful spice called togarashi. We have some almond meal here, and we have some grated Parmesan cheese. So. I'm going to add my spice mixture and I'm going to blend this. I 
until it's evenly distributed. One of the problems I've experienced with breaded foods in the past is the seasoning is not always evenly distributed. So now we have a nice homogeneous mixture. We have our egg yolk, or egg wash I should say. It's eggs and heavy cream. And what we're going to do is we are going to bread this. So we have our chicken thighs. Now what I did with these, are they're boneless and they're skinless. There's a little bit of fat on here, but that's okay because we're doing a keto diet and keto thrives on fat. Right? Your body produces ketones from the fat. So what I like to do is take these and put them in the breading. And I notice I'm using tongs because we want to be as sanitary as possible. And if I start getting too much moisture and then breading on my fingers, my fingers are going to be the ones that are breaded and we don't want that. So I like to start off by picking up some breading, putting it on both sides of the chicken, shaking off the excess, and then I'm going to lay these in my egg wash mixture. And this is somewhat akin to the standard breading procedure, which would be flour egg wash breadcrumbs, which is three stages. But here, instead of using flour for the first step, we're using the almond flour for the first step, then the egg wash, and then back into the breading. You want to make sure it's evenly coated so we don't have any breading that falls off. That's one of the important reasons of why we need to whisk that egg until it's completely homogenous. So, here we have our almond breading. We have our cheese, which is going to give us a little bit of added richness. And a fun fact about almond flour is it's going to actually add some extra protein to our sandwich. Right? We love protein and we love fat doing this ketogenic diet. And this is, like I said earlier, clean keto. We're not going to confuse this with dirty keto or lazy person's keto, as some people like to refer to it. Of course, you can eat all the oil and fat you want, but if it's not clean, you're not doing your body any favors. So before I fry this, I've got myself a little pan I'm going to transfer this to. Make sure that this is all evenly breaded. I don't want to drag or I don't want to carry breaded items across my floor on the off chance that the breading is going to fall off. So just press that chicken down. Make sure you got great even coating on there. No bare spots. probably do a couple more. I'm a big fan of cold fried chicken. I always was before I went keto. Life is no different now. So I'm going to coat these extra pieces because I love extra fried chicken. All right, so from the breading bowl to the egg wash bowl, Remember to take off any extra thick parts because they may fall off in the oil. And when you're frying, a few things to keep in mind is oil will eventually break down. Whether it be time, time and temperature, salt, detergent, moisture. So we want to give the oil the best shot we can. Since we're already using one of the finest oils, 
let's set it up for success. I don't want any excess breading falling off, contaminating the pot, and shortening the lifespan of the oil. So I'll put this off to the side since we're done with it. Just gonna roll these around a little, let them pick up some breading. And the beauty of using thighs is they're unevenly shaped, so they provide all these little wonderful nooks and crannies for the breading to stick to, which will then give us extra depth and extra crunch later. All right, we're almost done here. Alternately, if you don't have tongs and you want to use rubber gloved hands, feel free. Your breading is all used up. We're going to put this off to the side. Now, I use a probe thermometer. When my chicken is done internally, I know at 165 degrees Fahrenheit, it's good to go. So, over here, I have, you may notice, a candy thermometer, like I mentioned earlier, in my oil. It's reading right now between 325 and 350 Fahrenheit, so a little bit over 165 degrees Celsius, which makes it perfect temperature. I'll bring this over here. As you can see my setup, I have my hot palm oil, I have my chicken ready to go, and I have a landing pad. In the kitchens we like to refer to it as the landing pad, it's where everything's going to land when it's done. I'm going to use a slotted spider so when I scoop the chicken out of the oil, I leave the excess behind. I like to put it on a rack to drain any excess oil and for no other reason than that. So we're going to take our chicken pieces and we're going to gently put them in the oil. And I like to do two to three pieces at a time. Very important when frying that you don't overcrowd the pan. Overcrowding might mean the products might stick to each other and then they'll fuse. Overcrowding will prevent even cooking all the way around. Overcrowding will drop the temperature of the pan too much and if the pan temperature drops and the oil temperature drops and then the breading just absorbs the oil and gets soggy instead of getting nice and crisp. So here you can see we have the chicken bubbling away and this should take about uh, three to five minutes depending on the thickness. Some people like to take an item like chicken or fish or beef or whatever you're, you're frying and pound it out until it's evenly um, thickness across the whole product. By doing that you'll ensure that it will cook all at the same rate. Just gonna Make sure that these are separated. If you're working in a high volume kitchen, one tip might be to cook these about two thirds of the way done, or maybe 80% of the way, and then put them on that landing pad that we talked about, and then reserve them for later. If you're gonna do batch cooking, perhaps you're doing a large party or an event, you can cook these all two thirds of the way, rack them out on sheet pans, put them in the under refrigeration until you're ready to go and then finish them in a hot oven maybe at 325 degree Fahrenheit or 165 degree Celsius uh, oven for five to seven minutes and we call that batch cooking so just gonna come over here and see what we got see, oh look at that beautiful golden color on there that breading is sticking nicely to them. You may notice that the temperature came down a little bit, but it's still holding. We call that recovery because it's dropped the temperature from the cold product and it's recovering. So we now we know we don't want to overload the pan. While this is cooking, I also made some bread. Now, you might say to yourself, Whoa, I think can't you have bread on keto? Well, there's uh, many recipes online for keto bread and I like to do ones referred to as fathead rolls. 
And basically what that is, is mozzarella or cheddar, some cream cheese, a little bit of garlic powder, some egg, some salt, and you melt that together until it forms a, a ball. And then you fold in some almond flour. Sometimes I put a little bit of coconut flour in there for a little bit of extra sweetness, depending on what I'm going for. And then you chill the dough and then bake it. I'll be able to see here in the oven, I have a couple of rolls. Go to the new side of the cutting board, put one roll here, one roll here. Now I am going to take my probe thermometer, a little digital thermometer, and I'm going to check the internal temperature of the chicken because one, I want to make sure it's not undercooked, and I certainly want to make sure it's not overcooked. Just going to pick a piece up, and I still have a little bit to go. Gently place it back in there. You have to be very careful when deep frying. The last thing you want to do is splash the oil. Another little chef tip that I like to give people is when you place something in the oil, place it so if it drops, it drops away from you and the splatter goes away. The last thing you want to do is lay something in a pan this way and have it splash back up at you. That would be dangerous. Okay. Our chicken is now the correct internal temperature. I'm going to remove this and I'm going to bring it to my landing pad. I'm going to repeat with my other two pieces. My God, look at that color. I mean, that is just beautiful. We're going to let that drain while that drains. I'm just going to Continue my process, and I add the rest of this chicken to my oil. So here we have this beautiful chicken. You can feel it's super crispy. You can even hear it. Now. To make this all come together, clear off our workstation. We have our slaw. Remember, we made the Asian inspired aioli using the red palm oil. We have our chicken, which is used on um, the palm oil for frying. And we have our keto rolls. So I like to slice these open. And to this, I think it might be a nice little addition. I'm going to take a little bit of aioli, spread this on the bun. You know, making sandwiches is an art. I believe that every single bite should taste the same. So make sure when you spread sauces or dressings or whatever you do on a sandwich that it's perfectly even. You don't want one bite to be your favorite and then you follow it up and the next bite's slightly disappointing because it doesn't taste the same. As chefs, we are taught that consistency is everything. And I hate to say whether it's consistently bad or consistently good is equally important, but please make sure it's consistent. So here we have our aioli top bread. And I'm going to take a little bit of our slaw. Oh yeah. Put that down. Maybe two to three pieces of chicken on here. And then we have our top bun, and we're going to cover that. Place that on a sandwich and put a smile on someone's face. Isn't that beautiful? 
palm oil fried chicken, leg and thighs. It's in a nice, spicy, almond, keto-friendly, clean breading. We've got this wonderful mayo, or as I like to call it, Southeast Asian inspired aioli sauce. And it's crispy. It's satisfying. It's good for the planet. It's good for you. And this fills a need for when I'm not able to travel to Southeast Asia. In conclusion, when I cook as a chef, as a home provider, as a meal provider for my family and friends, I look for opportunities to use sustainable ingredients, especially Malaysian palm oil. I put in all sorts of recipes. I use it for marinades, I stir fry, I use it in salad dressings, emulsion sauces, grilling. And I use it not only because it's nutritious, but it's also delicious. And it's got this really, really great butter and mouthfeel. It's sustainable, we care deeply about the planet. I've, I've been to the plantations. I got, I was fortunate enough to visit the rainforests and the plantations in Malaysia, and I got to see how the Malaysians take incredibly good care of their people and our planet. So thank you for the opportunity to cook for you today, and I hope you have a chance to make this yourself.